Chapter 1 of Seeing Darkly. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Seeing Darkly by the Reverend John Sparhawk Jones. Chapter 1 Seeing Darkly. For now we see through a glass darkly. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12. By way of illustration, a parallel is here run between childhood and manhood, putting the one in apposition to our natural life in this world, and the other to typify a higher life, a life to come. This is an apt figure. Manhood is the period of the broadest development of our powers, and hence fitly stands for the immortal vigor and luxuriant pulse of a future and ideal state of being, whereas childhood is a preparatory, unpracticed, unripe stage of the human creature, during which he is only getting ready to live, storing up materials for use in succeeding years. For it has pleased his Maker to lead man, who is yet the masterpiece of creative skill, upon the stage of action in an unpromising plight, a child. He begins with unconsciousness and helplessness, and comes slowly to moral sentiments and intelligence. He begins with instinct and ignorance, and learns little by little the rudiments of knowledge and how to carry himself in the world. The astronomer who predicts eclipses and transits of Venus and lays off infinity had once to learn that two and two make four. Only by this road could he reach the higher calculus. The surgeon who dissects the fibers and demonstrates the human anatomy once spelt out with incredible difficulty the little monosyllable man. We begin with balls, whips, tops, and end with systems, creeds, philosophies, and theologies. And Paul here hints that even these are only bigger balls and more ambitious kites. At any rate, his reference is evidently to the notorious order of development among our faculties. Quote, when I was a child, I spake as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. Unquote. In other words, the subjects which interest a child and the mental processes of childhood are different from those of adult age. At the earlier period, mind is just dawning, learning to think, organize, compare, and has not attained to abstract ideas and finalities. Now, according to this fine analogy, man, living under the present order of things, is in his minority, will not become an adult of age, and be graduated until he has entered a higher state of being. Paul means to say that the questions which now occupy attention, the cares which vex and harass the whole web of mortal life, is, relatively, a childish affair. Like the rattles and straws, the Noah's Ark and mimic soldiers, which one discards when he buckles on the harness of life. Our pragmatical, pompous little world, according to this apostolic figure, is a wide nursery of infants in swaddling bands, learning to balance themselves, to carry themselves, to express themselves in the simplest syllables. The human spirit is cased and confined, at present, within narrow limits, can receive only oblique and straggling glimpses of higher certitudes. Man cannot look with open face and steady vision upon those full-orbed suns, but only sees them obscured and overcast. Hence the inadequacy and unsatisfactoriness of current religious knowledge. That unseen firmament where God dwells and works and divine tendencies rise and fall like the tides is not directly accessible. We are apprised of it indirectly. Now we see in a mirror darkly, imperfectly, obscurely. We read that the ancients, before the mechanic arts were advanced and perfected, used in their windows thin plates of horn or isinglass or some translucent material through which objects could be recognized in a general indefinite way. Their mirrors also were metallic and gave a blurred and vague outline, revealing the face, form, figure, but nothing clean and clear. And this is the homely analog by which Paul, comparing great things with small, sets forth our mortal apprehension of God and the sphere of angel and archangel and the whole spiritual economy. He says that living in this envelope of flesh, in this opaque and frosty air, beset by infirmities, perplexities, doubts, men do not get more than a fugitive, occasional glimpse of the great worlds of nature and grace, 
the wide kingdom of eternity with its tremendous machinery, its mighty invisible forces and laws, its thrones and principalities and orders of nobility, its priests and paladins and kings and elders, and all its processions and histories. These eternal reals we sense very imperfectly, do not see them in their naked realism, by reason of our feeble grasp, our fleshliness and sensuous crude organization. We look at the things of God and at the ultimate ground of being through a dim mirror and do not see the supernatural distinctly. Confessedly, this is an apt description of our case and of the posture of the human mind in relation to the highest topics of thought. It is certainly true that moral and religious ideas are part of man's outfit. We have them. We ponder them. We turn them over in reflection. Once in a while they flood the soul and ride high on the shore and submerge the low flats of our ordinary life and make the world look mean in the presence of their majesty. It is a stupendous truth that man can think about God and eternity, about the endlessness of knowledge and the beauty of holiness and the sovereignty of love and the ceaseless progression of the soul in all the higher elements of personality. Thinking upon these, one does not feel that he deals in fairy tales, in Arabian stories of enchanted palaces and impossible combinations. There is no sense of contradiction, grotesqueness, or absurdity cleaving to these supernal ideas. There may be a vein of superstition running through human nature, but if so, it is a reflection of something deeper, of a strong and silent undertow that sets out toward unseen kingdoms of miracle and wonder. All questions ultimately become religious questions if carried to their logical limits. So this rhetorical figure of Paul's is highly descriptive and forcible. This present, he argues, is the alphabet of universal knowledge, the childhood of immortality, the lowest form, the primer. Man, busied with manifold work, elaborating his philosophies, exploring nature, building bridges, founding cities, trying his experiments and rearing his civilizations, using his practical intellect and letting his idealizing, imaginative intellect and his aesthetic reason fly abroad and mount the heavens, is only beginning to try his infantile powers, and all that he ascertains, discovers, demonstrates is only hint flash, shadow of immense, unutterable, enduring substances out of sight. Thus men cannot give an adequate and satisfying definition of God, his mode of being, occupations, enjoyments. So soon as they attempt it, directly they are plunged into contradictions. Likewise in regard to the spiritual body, how it is equipped, its actions and passions, its ascensions and errands and immortal energies, this too is seen only through a dim mirror. The everlasting future also, who shall compass such a thought and fill it up with histories, experiences, vicissitudes, work? The bare idea of endless, conscious existence staggers us, strikes us dumb, casts us into suspense and silence. It is too vast, voluminous a thought to handle at our present stage. We think again of angels and archangels, of seraphs and the hierarchies of moral intelligence that rise tier above tier through the boundless dominions of God. M. Angelo, Raphael, Titian have depicted them with glistening wings and with glorias circling their heads, but we know little or nothing of the avocations, uses, ambitions, enjoyments of unseen and mortal creatures. We believe there are such, that there is no finer clay in the universe than man, no higher organism, no erect stalwart, lofty being compared to whom Plato would look like an infant, and the music of Mendelssohn sound like the preparatory scrapings and guttural hubbub of a discordant rehearsal, this, indeed, is not likely. Beyond us there surely are creatures more powerful, alert, sagacious, than we. Again, touching the future of the world and the progress of our species, we see in a mirror darkly. That there is a far-off goal toward which mankind slowly moves, and that one coming New Year day there shall be a clanging of bells and a clashing of cymbals and a chorus of hallelujahs proclaiming a kingdom of heaven upon earth, compared to which all that went before and all previous celebrations shall be like penny candles and penny trumpets, towards such a civilization and settlement all truly good men and women look forward. It is the burden of Hebrew prophecy, an age of harvest and of vintage, 
that shall gather up into itself all the power and glory of preceding ages, and be their grand, climacteric, and burning focus and fulfillment. But when and how this gorgeous horizon of purple and gold will unroll itself, what shall be the form and fashion of that time, its worship, creeds, laws, work? Concerning this, we see darkly. Men preach and pray about the millennium, a kingdom of righteousness and love, pillared and domed and set upon sure foundations on the earth. But when we come to particulars, the vision recedes, melts, dissolves into generalities. We see through a glass, obscurely. This is the fate that cleaves to all human imaginations touching the future and the unseen. We speculate upon the vast possible addition which would be made to man's information and capacity if, instead of five organic senses, he had six, seven, or ten. Unquestionably, a creature supplied with seven senses would have openings into the universe which we have not, and avenues of knowledge not available by us. Compared to such an one, man mayhap would stand in much the same relative position as a mole or dark burrowing animal stands to him. Yet in relation to the invisible firmaments and kingdoms that arch over us, man is like one who lacks the sixth sense, the appropriate organ, the prehensile grasp, or has it only in a rudimentary, ungrown form. There are phases of truth that only flicker on the horizon's brim. We know enough of them for practical purposes of reverence and obedience, but nothing at all commensurate with their amplitude and grandeur. Even the few sublime secrets that God has divulged through the Bible and in conscience, none of them probably appear to us, looking upon them from our shore, as they appear to higher and more powerful intelligences, and as they shall appear to man himself, when he has been armored with his sixth or seventh sense, and stands amid the stupendous developments and dawning visions of eternity. For then he shall see upon many sides that polygon which now he sees only upon one or two of its sides. Yea, verily, now we see through a mirror darkly. Nevertheless, we see, says Paul. We see something. We have hold of reality by the fringes, by the hem and skirts. Quote, we know in part, quote, but, quote, we know, unquote. Quote, we see dimly, unquote, but, quote, we see, unquote. Those conceptions which have risen upon the human mind touching God and the invisible are authentic and true. We may build upon them, we may take them for granted. Those religious definitions and ideas that have worked themselves clear from the mud and silt of superstitious accretion, and that commend themselves to the moral instincts and sober reason of the best part of mankind, these may be said to be known for all practical ends. We know, albeit in part, we see even though it be darkly. Unless earth, time, life is one stupendous delusion, a swirling eddy of aimless atoms, then it is certain that so far as the few great religious truths go, which have been revealed to man, they are real, reliable, substantial, worthy of all acceptation. Respecting them, we stand much where the astronomer does in the matter of the stars. He sets his telescope for Jupiter, Saturn, Sirius, and reports that he has found them. There they are, he says, each with its atmosphere and physical constitution, its day and night, revolutions, seasons, temperature, and chemistry. But when I push inquiry and ask him, are they inhabited? Have they parliaments and congresses, Catholics and Protestants? Do they favor a king or a president? Have they a pope and politicians? Is there what we call a civilization on those mighty orbs? Do they found colonies and send out fleets? Are there philanthropies and humanities there? Do they use our logic and multiplication table? Tell me about their customs, creeds, social usages. The astronomer answers, I know nothing of all this. I do not even know that those flaming worlds that cross my glass have any tenantry at all. They could not be of our human build and make in any case. I know only in part. I see through a glass darkly. But I see... I see enough to satisfy me that they are prodigious revolving globes supported by that same force of gravity which holds our earth ball together and keeps it going. What I do know about the sidereal heavens is absolutely and mathematically certain for me. So, similarly, 
it fares with those transcendental ideas and deep, mysterious presentiments that stir sensibility in man and excite wonder and hope. There is a hemisphere of them, lying in shadow, in the night, and another hemisphere wheeling through the gray, misty dawn and hence visible. True, I cannot adjust the foreknowledge of God with the moral liberty of man, but I see enough to know that there is an adjustment, a point of intersection, an eventual harmony. I cannot comprehend the mystery of the Incarnation or the person of the Christ. I cannot conceive the condition of disembodied spirits. I know nothing about heaven and hell. These and other high themes immediately present antinomies and contradictions in thought. Nevertheless, I see enough to convince me that there is something there, if only the human brain were big enough and the vision of mortal man keen enough to take it all in. As well might a caterpillar crawling leisurely over one arc of a great circle think of expounding that geometrical figure as I the immensity of God in his universe. The poor, dark worm would have to crawl for ages, past kingdoms of fish, bird, mammal, clear up to the mathematical man, before it would find out that, quote, a circle is a figure generated by the rotation of a line, one end of which is stationary, unquote. While this analogy between man and the caterpillar is by no means exact, since man has a born faculty and affinity for moral truth and religious ideas, there is yet this much force in it, that we mortal men are creeping along one single radius or segment of a circle that sweeps through all firmaments, its center everywhere, its circumference nowhere. Consequently, it happens that one says, quote, I am a Calvinist, unquote. another, quote, I am a pantheist, unquote. Another, quote, I am a deist, unquote. Another, quote, I am an agnostic, unquote. They stand at varying points of this huge circle, flinging its radii into space. Some see farther, some not so far, some not beyond their nose. But none see all, and all see darkly. The unity of God's design, the glory of his idea, the end of his creation, the fulfillment of prophecy, the consummation of this experiment of man on the earth, these immense horizons and unutterable things we apprehend, we know about them, but it is a partial, fragmentary knowledge. Like broad, round, red suns on glowing axles, they wheel across our object glass. We see them, but not on all sides, not perfectly, not adequately, not as they are. Now, in view of this disability, the practical concern for every man is to see to it that the mass of his ignorance and doubt does not cast any prejudice or injurious reflection upon what he feels must be true, what he is bound as a moral, responsible, religious being to believe and to practice. It is not likely that the everlasting future will impugn our fundamental beliefs. The rim of that vast wheel that revolves out of sight is surely rounded into perfect symmetry with that section of it which you see. All real truths are consistent. If you believe you have hold of one or more of them, you can safely steer by it. It will not wreck you. It will not deceive or mock you in the great hereafter. There are finalities. There are views of God, of sin, of redemption, of character, of destiny, which, instead of being swept away, doubtless will be enlarged and confirmed in the progress of the soul. I read that there are rivers on the globe that are fickle and treacherous and apt suddenly to change their channel, so that in time of flood the farmer may see their mighty waters strike a new pathway across his timberland and cotton field and swallow up his possessions. But there need be no fear that the current of divine purpose, by any sudden rise or turn, will wipe out and overwhelm those first principles and fast landmarks which are established in the best and most serious thinking of men upon supernatural things. We see darkly and dimly, nevertheless we see. Let us hold firmly by what we are sure of, and that commends itself to our reason and conscience. The Christian centuries and all the centuries have been at work digging, boring, blasting, smelting, trying to separate the slag from the ore, that which ought to be believed and done from that which is false, mischievous, or useless. The workmen all see in part, and prophesy in part, the stones are quarried and dressed gradually, and lie here and there, and only the master builder, in whose thought lives the archetype and plan of a perfect universe, can put them together in symmetry and order. Augustine works out his scheme, and Pelagius takes a divergent direction. 
Athanasius and Arius cannot agree, nor can Luther and Tetzel, nor Calvin and Socinus. Each of them says, quote, This is the truth for me. This is what the make of my mind constrains me to believe. Unquote. They all see in part and through a dim mirror, but doubtless some more accurately than others. The same is true in regard to the providential leading of the world and God's treatment of man. This also is a section of human experience that awaits the rising of the curtain and needs to be illuminated. Sir Henry Bessemer discovered a means of rapidly converting iron into steel by blowing a blast of air through the iron when in a state of fusion, by which the production of steel was enormously increased. So, too, the hard, dull iron of man's earthly history is, one day, to have a blast of air poured over it, the breath of the Almighty, whereby it will be converted into something quite different, and by a far better than Bessemer process. We can only dimly conjecture, at present, the meaning of sin, sorrow, pain, but the point which Paul presses is that these are parts of a larger whole, and that the higher unity will be grasped when man has reached a higher level. And here he is our spokesman, and voices the universal feeling. We do not quite see whither God is leading the world and the race. The years multiply, centuries rise and set. Meantime, what it all means, what is the inner logic of events, what the revolutions, changes, drifting of society signify, what they are ripening into, what will come next, this is not immediately apparent. The involutions are obscure, the intricacies are complicated. All is yet fragmentary, inorganic, vapory, unfinished. Nevertheless, we see in part, and that part will dilate toward greater amplitude and perfectness. Hold fast to what you see. Quote, cast not away your confidence, unquote. This is the error of men. They say, quote, there is so much we cannot understand. We will not take any of it, unquote. But this is a mistake. The kingdom of heaven is as a mustard seed. Do not despise the little you know and see. It is an installment of still better things. Seize upon it. Act upon it. Live by it. Oh, yes, the world is multitudinous, immense, but it is only a part. The earth is beautiful, but it is only a hint. Nature is gorgeous, tender, solemn and gay by turns, and full of suggestion, but nature is a symbol. There is much, too, in human society that is hopeful and of high augury. Civilization, culture, refinement, humanity are constantly rising higher on the shore and leaving a watermark where none had been before. The divine purpose for man is slowly filling up its vast orb. We may discern the general drift and direction. Some points have been gained in the long conflict of ages, yet what we see is only a part. New years come, but the new creation still tarries. Paradise is not yet regained. As you look out upon the world, in this early hour of the twentieth century, you see an unfinished edifice. You see the foundations and floors of a mighty building. You hear the broken, jangling rehearsal of a coming symphony. Whenever you espy a man who is trying to repent, to believe, to pray, to aspire, to live under the power of the world to come, he is a white blossom of the coming spring. Whenever you cherish a high resolve, a devotional mood, a spiritual affection, whenever you do an unselfish deed, it is the symptom and rudiment of the new constitution and order that is to be. Whenever you hear of any effort to lift society, to put down evil, to propagate the gospel, to bring in the precepts and spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ and to organize and operate them, it is a part of the plan, a segment of the circle of divine purpose. We see in part, we see darkly and through a dim mirror, and cannot foretell accurately unto what the swelling seeds and tender shoots and dawning possibilities of which the world is full will grow and what forms and flowering they will take on. Moreover, this our ignorance and dubiety is not a real disadvantage if we only act upon such knowledge and probability as we have. This is all that God requires. It is the hallmark of greatness and not a defect that the Bible does not tell everything, that the Christian revelation is not an exhaustive account and full explanation of all that men want to know about the unseen universe. Any school, church, sect, seer, or prophet that arises and claims by an inspired ecstasy or by a psychological penetration or a special permit to tell mankind more than the Bible tells about God and the future life directly arouses suspicion. We do not need to know more. 
we know enough already for practical purposes. It was not intended that we should see otherwise than through a dim mirror and darkly. Any new doctrine, interpretation, vision that purports to chase away the thick fog that sits upon the farther shore and to let in the light, and so to improve upon the Christian gospel, is prima facie a suspicious phenomenon. It is possible for one to tell you so much that you believe not a word of what he has said. He has overdone his part. The same is true in religion. The silences, the omissions of the Bible, its moderation and balance and self-restraint, this is part of its grandeur, part of its credibility, part of its case. What did Jesus say to his disciples? Quote, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Unquote. And again, quote, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Unquote. Oh, yes, the things the Bible does not tell, the secrets it does not reveal, its reserves, its reticence. How significant and weighty. Jesus awoke his friend, Lazarus, from a mysterious slumber. But no evangelist reports the man's subsequent conversations with his sisters, Mary and Martha. We should like to have had them printed large in the New Testament, certainly if he said anything to the purpose. The silences of Holy Scripture, how effective they are. Now we see through a glass, darkly. It was so intended. Any school, apostle, or doctrine that rises up in the world and says, quote, Come to me, I will tell you about God and heaven and hells and angels and the disembodied and the dead, about the millennium, and the battle of Armageddon, and the man of sin, and the time of the second advent, I will draw the curtain and show you things to come. Unquote. I merely say that was not Christ's method. On the contrary, he said so little, was so vague and meager, that all Christendom wishes he had said much more. But he knew where to stop. He was perfectly poised and sane. There is a voluminous gospel in what he does not say, as in what he does. Evermore it remains true that we see darkly. It is necessary. It is part of our education. We do not require to know much just yet. A little here goes a long way. I do not need to know the metaphysical nature of God, or about the state and occupations of the dead, or about the destiny of the heathen, or how many shall be saved, or how long the world is to last under present arrangements, and when the great historic drama of our planet will enter upon another act, or what rising hierarchies of angels there are, and what they look like, and what they do, and how they subsist, all this is irrelevant to my condition. We see darkly, but we see enough. We feel that there must be reality behind these appearances, that behind the universe must be a mind that made it, behind time must be eternity, Behind the carnal kingdoms of this world, the kingdom of eternal love that shall one day replace them, behind man's soul with its hankerings and hungers and thirsts and clamors, a God who can satisfy them, behind all the sin of the world, a salvation from it. Oh, yes, we see something of the eternal realities. We see their majestic shadows as they sweep by and the long train of light that follows in their wake. We hear the boom of a deep, mystical, solemn sea out of sight. And it is a great, inestimable thing to know even a little as we do, and to see through a mirror darkly. Hold on by that little. Add to your faith knowledge. Whatever religious truth or spiritual hope you have grasped, let it not slip. See to it that the years as they pass and as they come increase your faith and do not diminish it. Enlarge and enrich your nature and do not impair and impoverish it. For you should know more and see more clearly as time lapses. And as your pilgrim feet pass the milestone and approach the dark portal of eternity, not less but more is what you want. More life, more light, more certainty, more joy, more vision. It is a great thing for a man to live. For properly conducted, life means the bursting of bubbles, the snapping of rinds and bands, the collapse of quackeries and illusions, the falling of scales from the eyes, the sloughing off of old skins and shells, and getting out of the grub state, and moving on into light, and taking hold of reality and of God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Try to see ever clearer, even though through a glass, darkly. End of chapter 1
Chapter 2 of Seeing Darkly This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Seeing Darkly by the Rev. John Sparhawk Jones Chapter 2 Rahab Quote, And she said, According unto your words, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed, and she bound the scarlet line in the window. Unquote. Joshua chapter 2, verse 21. From one point of view, the action reported in this chapter does not command unqualified commendation. Actions differ in quality. Some of them appear absolutely and eternally right in any possible world. Others appear to be not intrinsically excellent, but expedient and lawful by reason of their bearing upon high ends of great value, which set up a justification and apology for them. In one view, the hospitable reception of the Israelitish spies by Rahab and her collusion with them was treason. Yet centuries later, her name stands in the roll call of departed valor and worth as a distinguished example of faith. Evidently, there is a higher law, a supreme canon of moralities, there are transcendent interests by which actions and careers must be ultimately judged. Looking at Rahab's conduct by itself, it cannot be applauded in that crisis of national peril when her country's liberty was at stake. Undoubtedly, she ought to have stood by her people. It was unpatriotic in her to listen to the traitorous suggestions of the Hebrew spies, or to harbor them for an hour. But, as matter of fact, we cannot always detach an action from its connections and environments and subsequent consequences. Actions must sometimes be considered in their larger relations. And a thing may be unconstitutional and irregular, and yet be right. And it is always better to be right than to be regular. Hence it comes to pass that a deed which in its local aspect and isolated is indefensible sometimes receives applause and a vindication when its affiliations and remote effects are made clear. At any rate, the author of the epistle to the Hebrews hints that Rahab's faith sanctified and condoned her treachery. Nor, observe, was it faith in a coming Messiah, for even the Hebrews just escaped out of Egypt did not profess that. It was not faith in the unity of God or in the Decalogue, for she was a poor, heathenish Canaanite, who had probably no inkling of those sublime truths. Rahab's faith was simply the presentiment, amounting to a profound conviction, that this wonderful, conquering race that had been campaigning through the land would take Jericho, eject the inhabitants, and settle on their premises, that these hordes pouring out of Egypt into Canaan had the unseen and upper powers on their part, and that the omens of victory perched upon their banners. She had heard that this multitudinous and aggressive people was spreading and rising like a freshet in springtime, she may have heard of how they forded the Red Sea and of their victory over Sihon and Og, and she believed that her countrymen could not stand up against the god of these strong Hebrews, that he had greater power and skill than the gods of Canaan. And this simple conviction and clear insight of the situation connected Rahab with the world's immense future and saved her, joined her by a moral sympathy with that race from which Messiah was to spring and in whom the whole earth is to be blessed. It is worth considering, then, that the gospel or divine heavenly message for one age is not by necessity identical or coterminous with that of another. It is a truism to say that there has been a development of doctrine, a process in the unfolding of moral and religious truth. No one individual, no one century can compass and appropriate the whole body of knowledge on any subject. New informations and new lights are ever more springing up, or else fresh applications of old and familiar truths are discovered. The human mind looks upon the orb of absolute truth from different distances and at different angles. The gospel delivered to the antediluvians was the impending flood and the instant need of repentance and reformation. The gospel delivered to the idolatrous kings of Judea and Israel by the holy prophets was the coming of captivity and exile. The grim Assyrian was God's bisom and scourge, and the need of national regeneration to fend off so great a calamity was declared to be the duty and business of first importance. The gospel delivered to the Israelites in the wilderness of Sinai was the earthly Canaan with its milk and honey, corn and wine, 
and the purpose of God to lead them thither and incorporate them as a body politic. The gospel delivered to them under the Levitical Institute was the necessity of instant practical obedience, even in minutia and circumstantials, and the virtue of altars and sacrifices to reconcile them to God in some mystical manner. The gospel revealed to Pharaoh in Egypt was that he should liberate the Israelites and allow them peaceably to leave his dominions. The gospel delivered to Gideon and Samson and Deborah and Samuel was that they should arouse the Hebrews to a patriotic zeal for their traditions, and should defend their country against heathen invasion, because it was the land of promise, given by solemn covenant to their forefathers. The gospel preached to the contemporaries of Christ, to the scribes and Pharisees and to that Jewish world, was the impending messianic age that it had actually arrived, and that they might enter upon a career of unexampled prosperity and renown, and achieve primacy among the nations by recognizing their opportunity. So, too, in the pagan world, wherever conscience has spoken, wherever any great moral censor or teacher has arisen to impress upon his time the sovereign ideas of duty, of self-renunciation, of accountability to God, and of the supremacy of the right and the true, there also and in that fact there has been a gospel for that age and for those who heard it. Indeed, moral and religious truth resembles the moon. One age sees it in the shape of a sickle or a crescent, another sees it between its quarters, but no generation has ever looked upon it full-orbed and on all sides, or seen more than four-sevenths of its surface. In the same manner, there is a secular evolution in the sphere of religious doctrine. Particular duties demands, obligations are laid upon an individual, a community, an age, and men are called to live along the rage of their knowledge and light. Now there is no telling what beliefs and prospects may have entered into Rahab's provision at that day. We cannot define or limit religious inspiration. God can enable the human soul to see much and far in ecstatic moods not given to ordinary judgment and observation. Doors may be opened into the heavens of the future, hasty glimpses may be vouchsafed, high suggestions may slide into one's soul, a sagacious penetration may be granted, illimitable ellipses and parabolas may spring across the void of immensity, along which the eye of the seer may travel, powerful presentiments can take possession of man. This was doubtless the case of the Hebrew prophets. Nor would it be possible to determine how much or how far Rahab saw. Only this that she had a deeper, truer gospel than her contemporaries. She saw clearly that that civilization was doomed and departing. She saw the handwriting on the wall, and she was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. A grand conception is this of the gradual disclosure of the will of God. Like the solar day, he does not burst upon the world unheralded. He reveals himself little by little. He tells one man and one age more than another, some are so dull that they catch no sound of him, some hear a little more, but none a great deal at any one time. One century interprets God in one way, another varies and widens the interpretation. One literalizes, another allegorizes. One mind lays the main stress upon the attribute of goodness, another upon power, another upon order, beauty, balance, another upon justice and irresponsible sovereignty. In a fragmentary way, in unequal portions, by successive revelations, God makes himself partially known to mankind. Thus the antediluvians had a gospel, and it was their prime business to heed and obey it, which they did not do. The patriarchs had one. The old Egyptians, with their transmigrations and animal worship, the Chaldean astronomers peering into the mystical pomp of the night at the placid, solemn stars, the flash and plunge of meteors, the pale beams and reddening dawn of the morning, all the changeful aspect of the eternal skies, they too had a gospel, living away back in their twilight time. The Persians, too, and all the old people whose glory has perished, each of them, doubtless, had a doctrinal belief in reference to the nature of God, and the duty and destiny of man, and it was their solemn part to revere and respond to these. It was not my gospel, nor yours. It was not Christianity, God manifest in flesh, but whatever absolute truth their creeds and cults held, whether little or much, it was important that they should learn to obey it. It is not necessary that one man should know as much as another, 
but it is always necessary that he should do what he knows. It is important and imperative that he should take and express in life and action those of his thoughts which represent things, and which stand for enduring substances and imperishable reals. Hence it is nothing to the prejudice of Rahab's faith even supposing that it did not include several elements that have since come to light and become fundamental to religion. These ideas were not then in the world, in the air, were not available, not to be had on any terms. No one had conceived of them. The soil was too thin and poor, the air too bleak and wintry for such fruits to ripen. One single serious truth was patent to Rahab. Quote, the Hebrews are coming, like the multitudinous waves of the sea. They are leveling every resistance before them, and are now breaking in tumultuous thunders round the rocky walls of Jericho. Unquote. This much was obvious to Rahab. Moreover, she cherished the shrewd surmise, amounting to a profound conviction, that they were the vanguard of the kingdom of light, and that the stars and the equities and the currents of law and the shuttle of destiny were all on their side and working for them. This was the fragment of truth revealed to Rahab, and her merit lay in the fact that she seized and acted upon it. Of course, she did not grasp the whole sequence of events that culminated in the incarnation of the Son of God, only the first link, the first fact, the occupation of Canaan by the chosen people. This was enough to save Rahab. That has served also to immortalize her. She subordinated the ephemeral politics of Jericho to the greater truth that old things must pass away, that there is a providential order, and that from age to age God incarnates his purpose afresh in new institutions and in higher forms. It was not large intellect, nobility of character, purity of life, a deep, rich, sensitive nature, any splendid virtue or harmonious combination of mediocre qualities producing a fine effect that has set her among the immortals. It was not that she foresaw the age of Christ, his discourse, miracles, cross and resurrection, and the subsequent centuries of Christendom. All these things were then sleeping below the horizon. But the fact was simply this, that the world had come to a fork of roads where it must make a sharp turn and file through a different scenery, and Rahab entertained the spies as the heralds of that new era, as those who stood in the forefront of the world's civilization. It was by faith that she did this. It was a clear persuasion that the supreme providence did not intend to perpetuate the outworn type of society that prevailed in Canaan, or to stock the earth with the kind of people who lived in Jericho. It was faith in a higher law, in a nobler nature, in a better morality, in a power that works for righteousness and order. The hearty acceptance of this truth lifted her clean above that crude, coarse age, and has lit up her brow with a gleam of fame, and encircled it with a nimbus. It goes to show that one does not need to know much, or to believe many things, but only to be true and loyal to the deposit of truth committed to him. Someone has wittily said that one's creed should not be longer than his decalogue, but this is often unhappily the case. It was not so with Rahab. She acted upon her convictions. Short and frosty as her light was, she followed whither it led a sure, firm grasp upon one great principle, an intuitive perception of its supreme importance, will carry her name wherever the gospel shall be preached. It is not so vital that one believes a long list of metaphysical articles as that one faithfully honor and daily practice what he does believe, the doctrine or duty clearly revealed to his conscience as obligatory and imperative. At any rate, this is what saved Rahab. Another suggestion of the story respects the imperfection of those human agents whom God employs to do his work. The individual selected to act conspicuous parts, and to stand, as it were, on the hinge of great affairs, have not always been such as we should antecedently expect, either in respect of intellect or of moral character. Our policy would always be to choose from the best men and women, in every sense of the word, the elite, the optimates, the true nobility of worth and mind, these we would anoint and consecrate and make them the commanding figures of history. But this has not been the historic program. God has chosen the foolish things to confound the wise. Moses in his basket of bulrushes, little Samuel from the mountains of Ephraim, the little Hebrew maid who waited on Naaman's wife, Joseph and David who followed sheep, Rahab the harlot, Peter, James, and John the Galilean fisherman, Matthew the tax-gatherer, 
these and many more such have been the candidates for promotion. The same is true also in what is called secular history. They who have invented, discovered, achieved in such a way as to impress themselves upon their time and make it memorable, would not always have been designated as the kings and captains of renown by our fastidious tastes and natural expectations. Their cradles were not invariably rocked amid luxurious surroundings, or hung around with bright blue and pale gold. Their parentage was not always gentle. Their disposition and inborn qualities were not altogether admirable. So that had you or I been present at the chief epochs and turning points in this life of humanity, and had we known the intimate thoughts and hidden soul of those who were providentially thrown to the surface and invested with power, and to whom it pertained to speak the last word in critical junctures, and to hold the helm through dramatic times of angry discussion and antagonism, it is not likely that we should always have approved of their temper, manners, or opinions. We might have said of one, he is a Pharisee, of another, he is an atheist, of another, he is a fast, loose liver, and another, he is a moving man of conceit, a preposterous fop, of another, he is a bear, a cynic, of another, he is a sly fox, a slimy viper, Take any forceful character and masculine genius who has trod this mortal stage with a grand, impressive air. William the Conqueror, Hildebrand, Henry the Eighth, Martin Luther, Mirabeau, Napoleon, Bismarck, and many another. And had you stood in the presence of such men, and noted their foibles, superstitions, mannerisms, meannesses, watched their conduct and heard their talk, probably you would have marveled that God had chosen such to represent any forward movement or work out any high purpose. It is by no means certain that righteous Noah would have suited us. Abraham, too, might have been found quite disappointing, nor would wily Jacob have filled up our idea and left nothing to desire. Samuel and Elijah would have seemed stern, cruel, and implacable upon occasion. St. Paul, Augustine, John Chrysostom, Constantine, Cromwell, Calvin, Erasmus, prophets, priests, martyrs, mystics, reformers, saints. Perhaps there was not one of them but would have disclosed some obvious weakness, some glaring fault, sufficient to compromise him. But if so, the evil that was in them was not allowed to upset the providential plan. Each was enabled to play his part, because the main interest seems to have been to get the necessary work done. As to who should do it has been a secondary consideration, the tools have fallen to those who could handle them. Hence, much hay, wood, and stubble have been mixed with useful and indispensable characters. Many have been badly pockmarked, but have been chosen not for the evil, but for the grain or two of essential good that was in them. Some one quality or force they had, necessary to the time, and that must be invoked to save a tottering world. It may have been leonine courage, tenacity of purpose, a faculty for rapid organization, it may have been executive ability, it may have been the power of expression and vigorous speech and trenchant invective, the gift to arouse and incite supine and coward populations, the fire of Demosthenes, it may have been the foresight and finesse of a diplomat, or a power of patient endurance and unwearied industry and indomitable will which the crisis called for. But whatever property or trait it was, upon this the soul of the time seized. God chose this individual. God thundered out of his Zion, saying, Hic est, this is he, this is my Cyrus, my Alexander, my Nebuchadnezzar, my Alaric, my Mahomet, my Luther, my glittering sword to cut the hard knot, to shear away the tangle, to shovel out the congested mass of lies and cobwebs. This is my magical key to open the gates of justice and mercy to mankind. Hence it happens that individuals often seem to stand in the same relation to the progress of society and the betterment of the world that mortar hods, windlass, block and tackle bear to structures of brick and granite. They are good and necessary for the work, for the exigency. They have it in them to do what no one else can do, and so are tolerable, are even applauded, so far as they go. Their sole merit lies in this, that they have some one virtue that is apposite to these circumstances. Men are often God's sword, hammer, trowel, torch, his ox goad, whiplash, dynamite, to alarm, arouse, punish, shatter, or overturn, as the case may be. Take the individual apart from this function, and there is nothing in him. Set him down at another date and in different conditions, and he will not be heard of, will die uncelebrated, unsung. 
but toss him into a day of tumult, of hissing and astonishment, and he has it in him to speak peace, to command the waters that they subside, and the dry land that it appear. Thus it is that God uses that in men which is fit and apt to fulfill his ends. Four-fifths of the individual may be unsound, unclean, irrelevant, abominable, but the fractional balance is just the thing demanded by the age, by the hour, and so is harnessed and set to work like blind, brawny Samson grinding in the mill. Because the work must somehow be done. The world has a pre-established orbit. God has a path, a destination for it. It is not a green-coated, stagnant pool filled with frogs, but a broad, glancing river seeking the sea. There is a divine idea dominating and directing all things. Whatever great and fine faculty any one has, the master builder will hew and dress it as a cedar from Lebanon, and set it up as a pillar in its place. The rest of him may be rubbish. Men are serviceable and are saved by what is good in them. Consequently, if the problem be to find perfect, flawless men and women, it is a vain quest. Such never have been here. St. Paul told the Lyconians, quote, We also are men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities. Unquote. In that word he struck clear and firm the note of difference. In the ground forms and in his centrality man is one, but some have larger intelligence, loftier aims, deeper convictions, more moral courage, a profounder sense of unworthiness, a livelier sense of divine things, more idealism. It is in regard to these occasional glimpses of higher truths, and the power of subordinating the seen and sensible to the unseen and imperishable, that men chiefly differ. All are full of shortcomings, all have to fight the animal, the demon within, some more, others less. If the moral government of the world had been conducted upon the principle of throwing out this one because he is obstinate and combative, and that one because he is sensitive and irritable, another because he is vain and vaporing, another because he is coarse and common, another because his cradle was rocked in a garret by a poor, pale, distracted mother, another because he is a bastard or a glutton or the like. I say, if all the Ishmaelites and Esau's and Nazarenes and Boeotians were cast out of the world story, simply because there is something about them that awakens prejudice or inspires contempt, and that does not square with the highest standards of dignity and fitness, in that case there would not have been material enough to do the world's work. Human history would hardly have got past the Ark and the Deluge if divine providence had waited for men and women fit in all senses to wear the mitres and lead the armies and execute the laws and write the literatures of the world. But God is not afraid of weakness, imperfection, and sin. He can overrule it. He can mold it like dough or clay. He can work with depraved, disproportionate materials toward superlative issues. Not only the good, serviceable material, but the obstinate and obstructive is manipulated by a skill that defies defeat. No noble scheme, no beneficent impulse was ever given to the race that did not directly gather around it unworthy creatures, hungry camp followers, time-serving hangers-on, to spoil and disfigure it. The finger marks of human handling are visible on everything, so that, if God were to wait for immaculate men and women to give currency and ascendancy to any one of his ideas and ends, it would suffer an indefinite postponement. But this has not been the divine policy. God chooses the harlot Rahab to open the promised land to the Hebrew people. Her lying fabrication and deceitful craft are taken up like threads in the fast-flying shuttle of the Almighty and wrought into his design. He leaves men to act out their natural and spontaneous instincts and turns these to the best account. The actors pass. The principles abide. Look at any new theory, institution, or order that has promise in it, and you will likely be scandalized by the jealousy, selfishness, spite, low views, private interests of those who are seeking to organize it. The thing seems to be a whetstone, and each has an axe to grind. But look away from the human agents and their infirmities, and consider them as attorneys and trustees. Turn your eye to the practical, ultimate, and final end, the substantial values involved, and there you get the true angle of vision and the right impression, and are encouraged once more. It will not do to study individuals too closely. Few can stand the limelight. Judge no cause entirely by its advocates and disciples. 
had even the Christian religion been estimated by reference to those who made up its first following, the worldly wise would have said, quote, This thing will founder in our time, will not outlast the century, unquote. And had we witnessed Rahab and the spies concocting treason in her shanty on the town wall, out of such a low origin and wretched intrigue, no man would have predicted the throne of David, or the magnificent age of Solomon. But someone has prettily said that great events march through gates that are set on small hinges. We must study the event, the drift and development of things. Observe also the mode of Rahab's deliverance. She bound the scarlet line in the window. This was the preconcerted signal which Joshua and the Hebrew army agreed to recognize and honor when they entered the land. It was a typical transaction, for the central truth of the gospel lies embedded here. In that dark and brutal age, God intimated in cipher that he would one day conclude arrangements for the reduction of this sinful world to the obedience of Christ. The parallel is impressive. Rahab seems to prophesy. For in this dramatic action is depicted the serious truth that our world is a heathenish, ungodly Jericho that must be ransacked and revolutionized and set on a better basis. It must be searched and cleansed and receive a new constitution. A loftier manhood must come in, a higher and finer social order. And to prefigure this future, God has displayed from the walls of our world Jericho a scarlet line, a flaming banner, and has lifted up a holy cross as a hopeful signal. In this Old Testament story, behold a vivid picture of darkened, depraved man waiting for a deliverer, waiting for a kingdom of purity, righteousness, and love. I can see Rahab examining the casement from day to day to find whether the line would hold or had slipped. Every night she listens if she can catch the multitudinous murmur of the approaching host. How often does she strain her eye in that direction? Through all the hours of the day her continual thought is, they are coming. It may be tonight, perhaps tomorrow, certainly by this day week. It cannot be long ere the Hebrews are here. Then she looks at the scarlet line for the hundredth time to see that all is right and according to stipulation. Now these things are an allegory. Yonder shanty on the wall and its red rag fluttering in the breeze is an Old Testament sign of a New Testament truth. It means a beleaguered world that must some day capitulate to a righteous king. It means a Canaan of idolatry ignorance, and sin, flying a flag of distress, and waiting for a redemption, for a better covenant, a new era, a kingdom of light and of holiness. And the personal question for each one is this, do I know that I belong to an evil generation, to a sinful race, and do I long for a liberator, a savior, or am I content with my native Canaan, its sins and shams and shames, and all its disorder? Quote, the Son of God goes forth to war, a kingly crown to gain. His blood-red banner streams afar. Who follows in his train? Unquote. End of chapter 2For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Seeing Darkly by the Rev. John Sparhawk Jones Chapter 3 The Unprofitable Servant Quote, But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he has come from the field, Go and sit down to meat, and will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant, because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all these things which are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Unquote. Luke chapter 17, verses 7 through 10. Had Christ thrown out this parable avowedly against the doctrine that the end of man is happiness, and that this was the purpose in his creation, he could not have hit his mark more accurately. There is such a doctrine, and it is wildly prevalent, that God, as a being of infinite love, has only one motive, or principle of action, which is the production of happiness. Men differ as to the meaning of life, that is, what it was given for, why it was bestowed. 
The problem of existence is one of the ultimate, insoluble problems, and the most comprehensive of all, and will always receive different interpretations, so long as man continues in his present state of ignorance and doubt. There are those, and perhaps they compose the majority, who believe that God, having brought man hither without the assent of his will, is morally bound to take care of him, to provide for him, to support him, and even more than that, to make him positively happy, to give him what is called a good time, and make his life on earth a success from a material point of view, by supplying him with creature comforts and conveniences. Seeing that this is notoriously not the fact, and that man, on the average, is not supremely happy, does not get what he strives after, is constantly balked and frustrated, and is a creature of great expectations and small results, many, perceiving this painful fact, have taken refuge in the alternative that either God is not infinitely powerful, or, if so, not infinitely benevolent. Starting out with this bold postulate that a perfectly benevolent creator must, of necessity, desire first of all the happiness of his creatures, many have been driven to the conclusion that God is not really omnipotent, that he is handicapped and obstructed by the materials in which he works and by the exigencies and inevitabilities of the case. The logic of the situation compels them to sacrifice his practical omnipotence and to say that he cannot do what he would like to do, what it is the free, spontaneous instinct of his gracious nature to do. Whatever be true or false in this doctrine, it is clear that Christ, in this illustration, takes no account of it, and does not recognize it at all as a solution of the problem, but takes an entirely different line, and expounds both God and man under different relations and upon another principle. Indeed, as a rule, Christ is not philosophical or analytic, does not go deeply into the reasons and roots of things, or defend the divine moral government from the objections and aspersions of men. Rather does he fall back upon his native authority, his moral intuitions, his sense of reality, and, instead of arguing, announces, states the fact as he sees it to be. This is a characteristic trait of Christ's discourse. He is direct, dogmatic, and final in his method of handling metaphysical and religious questions. Take, as example, the present context. Here the whole perplexed problem of man living on the earth, man and his world, is suddenly opened up. Why is he here? What is the purpose of his existence? How does he stand related to God, his maker? How should he feel towards God? What is man's proper posture in relation to God? Evidently, it is an immense question. We recognize it as once as one of the old, gray, eternal questions, old as nature, old as the human heart. This is a stone of Sisyphus that generations have rolled in front of them and found no landing place for it. One man one school says God is morally bound to nourish, protect, and eventually save all his rational creatures from damage and destruction. Others say, no, this one does not plainly appear, save upon certain moral conditions, with which the creature must freely comply. So the battle roars and thunders and volleys between opposing camps. It is an age-long controversy, an outstanding question. What is the end and meaning of life? What are we here for? Does God owe anything to us, or do we owe anything to Him? Does man fulfill life and exhaust its significance by enjoying himself, by helping himself, by satisfying his appetites and ambitions, and carving out his own fortune in his own way? Or is there more involved in life than that? Is it a scene of moral issues? Is it an opportunity to discharge a debt man owes to divine laws and to God as the source and sum of them? Observe, then, that this is really a serious question, not a surface question, but one that is implicated with the whole action and conduct of human life. In brief, it is a question of who shall be first, man or God. Undoubtedly, the whole tendency of human nature is to make man the standard or unit from which calculations shall be made. For, if anything falls into the life of the average man which he does not like, which crosses his plan, or thwarts his wish, or interferes with his convenience, or disappoints his hope, directly he is prone to impeach the divine providence. If, indeed, he believe in a God, as harsh, inconsiderate, even unjust. In other words, our native instinct is to measure and graduate all events and happenings, good fortune and ill fortune, 
by reference to our own personal preference, to our conception of what would serve our private interest. But evidently this is not the doctrine of Jesus in the parable. Rather does he teach that, totally irrespective of our own selfish gratification and supposed welfare, we are to appeal all questions to a higher tribunal, the will of God, and to decide and act, in every case, agreeably to those ends and aims which are of his very nature. Anyone may see, then, that this teaching of Christ is of the most thorough and radical sort, and calculated to revolutionize his whole plan of life. Because the average human being asks first, what do I want? What will suit and serve me? What is my interest? What is expedient? Whereas the right question for him is something quite other than this, and he should rather inquire, what is my duty? What is the divine requirement of one in my circumstances? But let us look more closely into this teaching. Obviously it contains two leading ideas. One, that man's chief business here is to work, that is, to do righteousness, to fulfill moral obligation, to accomplish the will of God as revealed to him. The other idea is that having done this, he should wait patiently for the reward and recognition of his toil. But our first and clear duty is work and obedience, loyalty to truth, to the right and the good, and this without any outlook upon ulterior gain or advantage. Quote, which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he has come from the field, Go and sit down to meet? Unquote. This is the homely imagery under which Christ sets forth the prime truth that man is and ought, first of all, to be a doer of duty. It is impossible to overstate the importance of the principle here laid down, that our part in this world is primarily the part of a servant, whose function is exhausted in doing promptly, faithfully, thoroughly what he is told to do. Man is not set down on this planet to be a judge of it, to be a critic or censor of it, either of its natural laws and processes and its adaptations as a scene of sentient and rational life, or as a platform of providential purpose and of moral probation, although the speculative intellect leads in this direction. Like the Castilian monarch of whom history makes mention, one imagines that he could have built a better world and one more suited to be the habitation and home of man, but this is not really the question. It does not become man to sit magisterially and judiciously upon the earth and time as the scene and sphere of their choices and activities. The parable settles this decisively. Man is under authority. He is under orders. He is properly at the beck and call of another. He is not the master of his own time. He is at service. He is a hireling. He has to give account of himself. This is the Christian idea. He may be a philosopher, naturalist, geologist, biologist, thinker, or practical man of affairs, but whatever he be, this is a secondary role a species under a larger genus. Primarily and chiefly, he is here to obey, to fulfill and complete the great moral ends indicated in his structure and capabilities. The divine commandments, the fashioning of the will, the perfection of his nature, the glory of God, this is man's chief end, for this cause came he into the world. All this is foreshadowed in the text under the image of a servant plowing and feeding cattle in the field. You see the type of Christ's theology. He makes the divine law, the moral imperative, supreme and final. There is no hint here of the dignity and divinity of human nature in any such sense as lifts it above the necessity of consulting a higher law than its own caprice or natural preference. The parable does not glorify or canonize man, or in any wise exalt him. It calls him a servant, implying that he has responsibilities, is strictly accountable, and must report, at sunset, the work of the day. Thus, by this neat little illustration, Christ cuts away from under human feet the whole ground of merit, of superfluous extraordinary merit, as though men could acquit themselves in such a grand, successful style, as to lay God under obligation, so to speak, to make him debtor and mankind his creditor. There is nothing of this in the doctrine of Christ. Quote, did he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. Unquote. For what was the servant there, if not to wait and to serve? 
Mark how absolutely Christ abolishes the very possibility of men acting in such a way as to surprise God or lay him under contribution, or make him debtor to their fidelity or generosity or painstaking care. Yet this is not the common notion. Human nature is constantly bepraised and bestrewn with flowers and incensed with applause on account of some act that overpasses, by a little, the average experience and action of men. We cry out, noble, grand, heroic, splendid, over some deed of courage or benevolence or self-sacrifice that startles a community with a shock of grateful surprise, as though something had happened that ought to be published in other worlds and nailed upon the outposts of creation to attract the gaze of angels. Thus, a person of large wealth makes a creditable contribution to a good and needy cause, and straightway the fact is blazoned abroad as a princely generosity, a munificent gift. But what is it? Has he touched his capital? No, indeed. Has he impaired his income? Not a bit. He is too shrewd for that. He has only given a thin slice and paring of his superabounding wealth to a hard-bested and struggling cause. That is the whole of his service. He has simply done his duty. Strictly considered, he deserves no praise, and if he be a good man, he knows it. He considers himself an unprofitable servant, has only done what it was his duty to do. Or on a wild night, in mid-Atlantic, the sea boiling like a pot, the wind blowing like blasts of doom, a laboring, disabled vessel, in danger of being engulfed, sights and signals another of its distress. The captain of the stanch craft heaves to and lies beside it all night, and in the gray of morning takes off the imperiled and affrighted passengers. The deed is wired over the civilized world as one of magnificent daring and moral heroism. But what else should he have done? At bottom, was there really any great merit in not leaving those people to perish in the hungry sea? He simply did what it was his duty to do. Or, take the case of a young man, the only son of his mother, and she a widow. He is her rod and staff. He lives to support her. He works to supply her wants. He denies himself much in the way of pleasure and diversion in order to be her companion, and to make her declining years comfortable and happy. Indeed, he has become proverbially famous in his community for filial piety and fidelity. People quote him, cite his example, hold him up as an ideal of imitation, dilate upon his virtues and his grand singularity among the mass of young men, who are either a heaviness to their parents, or else of neutral, indifferent tint. Yet, after all, what has this hypothetical youth done which entitles him to such high encomiums? Has he done more than his duty? Who should take charge of his desolate, bereaved, lonely parent, if not he? All that he has really accomplished is the observance of the fifth commandment, to a degree of completeness, unusual, exceptional. Carefully considered, he has done no more than discharge a simple, natural obligation, and one that would be recognized by an unsophisticated conscience. Or, suppose the case of a physician, living in a community overtaken by a devastating epidemic. They who are alive and reasonably well have fled, and are fleeing the infected town, for fear black death catch and prostrate them. But meanwhile the good and faithful physician stands at his post, keeps cool, calm, and clean, observes every hygienic precaution, goes about his business, administering with skill and judgment to the symptoms of the fever-stricken, the doomed and dying, until little by little, and day by day, the disease shows signs of waning, and its cruel grip relaxes. What shall we say of this brave man? Has he laid up a fund of extraordinary merit? Has he incurred great risk? Has he stayed in a poisoned, putrid air, plying his profession against momentous odds, and without calculation of self-interest? He has certainly been faithful when perhaps many would have been recreant or derelict. But, on the other hand, what is the business of a physician if not to attend the sick? Did he receive his diploma merely to medicate a certain class of trivial ills? Was it clearly understood that he should have liberty to abandon the community in case he saw it to be expedient? Looking at the situation closely, did this good man achieve more than his duty by remaining among his people and putting his medical knowledge, experience, and skill at their disposal? The fact is that in all such instances the reason why men are belauded and held up for admiration as exceptional individuals of rare virtue, courage, fidelity is because they are truly exceptions to the general rule. It is not because they have actually done more and better than they ought to do, but rather because they have surpassed the ability and achievement of average human nature. 
For, in truth, we do not expect much from ordinary human nature. Any one who has lived long has discovered that he cannot rely confidently upon it. It is shifty, selfish, calculating, timid, mean, ungenerous, deceitful, not large, open, noble, ingenuous, and true. This is a simple fact which every one has occasion to verify on his passage through the world. And when one here and another there, and a third yonder, transcends the ordinary level and rises unto grand achievement, and does a truly great and noble deed, above the compass and range of average humanity, thus betokening a royal soul, the spectacle is so unusual, so phenomenal, that it jostles us into exclamations of surprise, into shouts of applause. Men are not used to it. They do not see such sights every day. They do not live among saints and heroes and philanthropists and patriots, but among common clay, men and women of human passions, frailties and faults, whose whole life is pitched on a low key and actuated by selfish and sinister motives. It is the force of contrast that evokes our admiration. It is the element of novelty and surprise that arrests attention and makes the world cry out over some act of courage, self-denial, fortitude, bravo, Yuja, well done, good and faithful servant. In all such cases, the individual has no wise exceeded his duty and moral obligation, has not done more than a vital conscience and the moral law enjoin, nor put God in debt to him. And the only reason why his public heap praises and rosebuds and compliments upon him, or rend the air with cheers, is that they have found, at last, something that looks like a man, one who has nobility, breadth, elevation, a trace of royal majesty, and one or two qualities they are accustomed to think of as ideal and really worshipful. It is the comparative rarity and extraordinary character of the phenomenon that startles and arouses and makes us enthusiastic. Let us rid our minds of the notion that we can exceed our duty, that we can be truer, more faithful, more conscientious, more loyal to divine commandments than God requires. A certain young Jewish nobleman imagined that he was the pure gold of moral rectitude, and ventured, on one occasion, to apprise Jesus of the fact. But it appeared in the sequel, and as the result of cross-examination, that his extravagant claim was disallowed, and that he had not even suspected the spiritual nature and latent implications of the moral law. God does not owe you a farthing of compensation. No man can go to God and say, Pay me what thou owest. He has no case. He has no claim. He has not worked overtime. He has done no more and no better than he should have done, and than could reasonably be expected of him in his circumstances. Mark this well. It is a doctrine men need to hear and heed. The best you can do, your masterpiece in that line, your highest strain of moral effort, is no more than God requires, hopes for, sets up ahead of you as the goal toward which you should run. Let us seize this sublime idea of duty, our whole duty, as the very least that can be required. God can ask no less of any moral being than that he should discharge his plain duty. All boasting is excluded. When you have done all, when you have fulfilled all righteousness, you have only done what you ought to do. This is the clear teaching of Christ in the parable. He cuts away beneath our feet all ground of pride and self-gratulation. No man, howsoever laborious, dutiful, conscientious, and faithful to the letter of the commandments, has really enriched God, augmented his resources, revenue, happiness. Howsoever wisely he has invested his talent, and whatever increment of value has accrued on this account, this has not materially increased the power and glory of God. Man, at the best, is an unprofitable servant, this is the sentence of Christ. And the best, most useful men and women in the world affirm this decree and perceive it to be true. The noblest and worthiest specimens of our species are the humblest, plume themselves upon nothing they have done, declare themselves to have been simply instruments in the Almighty Hand, take no credit, and assume no superiority. A strange paradox it is that the more one accomplishes that is really worth doing, the less it appears to him to be, and the more there seems yet remaining to be done. Thus it comes to pass that when persons of active and powerful talent, 
who have wrought mightily and beneficently in their time pass away, they count themselves, for the most part, to have been a failure, and their life a disappointment, comparatively abortive and fruitless, because they contrast what they have had a hand in and have actually achieved with the immensity, the continental reach, and magnitude of what yet remains untouched and unattempted. So they seem to themselves to be like coral insects, building atom by atom, poor little ephemeral creatures that add in their short day but an infinitesimal item and microscopic speck to the slowly rising pile. Yes, the men and women of energy, of insight, of fertility, of execution, the thinkers, the workers, who really add to the world's intellectual and moral wealth, will be the first to admit that after all they are unprofitable servants. These are they who are clothed with humility, and who ascribe all they are and have to the permission of God. There is another idea contained in the context, and that is the necessity of waiting. It appears that when the servant of the proprietor returned from the field, instead of immediately eating supper, he was bidden to postpone that function until the lord of the estate had first satisfied himself, after which he, in his turn, should partake. Under cover of this familiar figure, Christ clearly teaches that man's part in relation to God is not only to serve, to do the will and work of God in the world, but more than that, not to expect recognition and reward straightway and publicly as a matter of course and a matter of right. Patient waiting. This is also a lesson of the parable. And probably it is harder for human nature to wait than to work. There is a certain exhilaration about working, getting things done, attaining what one had set out to accomplish, and seeing it actually finished, and standing a completed whole. There is a joy in this oft-times which one does not find in the patience of hope, in quiet waiting for a longed-for consummation. Taking man as he is made, a restless, hungry, ambitious, discontented creature, full of clamors and cravings and unsatisfied desires, Waiting for a desideratum is about the hardest thing he can be set to do. Hence it comes to pass that patience is one of the regal qualities of the soul. Patience is truly great. To endure, to wait upon a deferred hope, to stand still until the salvation comes, this is a business that calls for a sublime faith, for grit and steadiness and composure and a brave spirit. It was this splendid quality that made William of Orange and Washington historic names, and has lifted them into the pantheon of departed and deathless heroes. Because among other traits they possessed this Olympian serenity of soul, this power of holding on by a forlorn hope, which yet was to them a virtuality, a sure divination and presentiment of eventual victory. No one can be really great without patience. You must know how to wait how to accept defeat gracefully, how to bow to the inevitable fact, in sure hope of a better and blessed future. To wait, in a world constituted as this, is quite as important as to work. Indeed, they are probably numerically more, by far, who can work industriously and diligently than can wait contentedly and quietly. Man is hasty, eager, impulsive. He will compress results. He will sup immediately upon coming from the field. He must have his wages promptly. His money is due as soon as his servants is rendered. This is his rule. But it is not God's law in the kingdom of providence. Quite otherwise. For if history and human experience, collectively considered, carry any lesson, it is just this, that the pay, the hard cash, does not come directly upon the completion of the work. All experience confirms this conclusion that the world is not a scene of exact adjustments and fair compensations. Ask the martyrs, the witnesses for any great imperiled truth, the patriots, the workers in any field of high enterprise, the inventors, the discoverers, the heroic men and women who have sacrificed themselves and their all in some great interest whether they received an offset and material consideration for all their toil, pain, anxiety, and mortification, and they will say, no, not in coin, not in gold, not in houses and lands and fine raiment and chariots, not in praise and pudding, but in the answer of a good conscience, in a consciousness of rectitude, and in the blessed hope of ultimate reward in a day of righteous judgment. Nothing is more notorious than that the servants of God do not get paid promptly in this world. The world is not built that way. 
it is rather built upon the principle announced in the text, quote, gird thyself and serve me, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink, unquote. But this does not suit the taste of most men. They want to sup now, when things are savory and smoking. And by consequence, it turns out that seeing they cannot do this, but are obliged to wait, many wax weary and fall into ill humor and fret at inequalities of divine providence, and the hard logic of events, and the mystery of God's ways with men, who, in place of dealing out microscopic justice here and now, often leave them in the lurch, in suspense, in darkness, in humiliation. This is, at bottom, the reason why you will often see those who a while since were shouting lustily for what they called an eternal principle suddenly weaken and grow limp and strangely quiet. The fact is, they were there for what could be made out of it. They wanted pelf, power, place, patronage, the spoils, and discovering after due trial that these were not available, not ready to be dispensed, their ardor cooled, they became offended and withdrew. It did not suit them to wait. They had not the right grit. They were not true metal. They did not ring true. Their motive was cankered at the root. The world abounds in that type of character, not principled, not ingenuous, not whole, not pure gold, but contrarywise, the supreme dynamic. With such is palpable profit, some prospective benefit or personal promotion or mercenary advantage upon which they have set their cold, keen eye, and which, if it does not shortly fall into their lap, their immense enthusiasm for moral ideas, truth, righteousness, education, justice, or what not, suddenly collapses and falls flat. These servants cannot wait. They must sup at once. How true to human life is Christ's parable! This thing of waiting takes up pretty much all our time. Yet we can do anything better than that. In fact, we have to wait for everything that has substantive value and intrinsic worth. The best wine comes last. The faculty for waiting is the one most in demand at present. He who can wait longest, most patiently, cheerfully, hopefully, holds the winning card in life's subtle game. He is apt to get what he wants, or if not, he sees the triumph from afar, and rejoices that the prize will fall yet later to others who are working on the same lines, and to the same great end. Verily, this is the virtue required of all of us, and the test that best searches out and settles one's faith in any principle, doctrine, or policy is this. How long is he willing to work and wait, unrewarded, uncheered by success, yea, reviled, persecuted, in a forlorn minority, yet baiting no jot of heart or hope? This is the probe that searches deep, and we cannot stand it. We wince and weaken. Oh, we can bawl out glittering platitudes upon public platforms. We can carry the banner in the van amid throbbing drums and a tempest of cheers. We can vote with the majority. We can publish our opinions when it costs nothing, when it is perfectly safe and quite popular. But to return from the field after a day's plowing and feeding cattle, and then gird one's self to wait, this is a thing of different complexion. This goes to the root of the matter. This declares a man, identifies him, shows him up, and ascertains whether he be a dishonest windbag and canting hypocrite, mouthing a histrionic part for appearance, a poor, false creature covered with electroplating to disguise the base elements in him, or a true man with a vitalized conscience, a courageous, columnar champion of a truth he holds dear and is ready to work for, waiting for its coming in great power and glory, yea, even to die for it. Learn a lesson from Christ's parable of the waiting servant. You must not expect much in your day. It does not belong to you to decide upon the date for any great change. It is not for us to know his times and seasons, whose way is in the deep and who makes the clouds his chariot, or how long it will take the historic drama of our planet to work itself out. The eternal processes of God's kingdom are slow and secular. They lapse leisurely. The stars burn and burn out. The moons wax and wane. The great ages roll onward, but still God's purpose tarries, gets itself incarnated in this or that form or institution, and then shatters it as a shackle and impediment and unfit for its use, and migrates into some other shape. The whole web of human history, being interpreted, means simply man waiting upon God. 
plowing and feeding cattle and waiting to sup, waiting for fruition, for rest, for victory, for heaven, for the kingdom of God in some authentic sense. This is our vocation. It is ours to plow, to weed, to sow, to put in the spade and the pick, to tug and toil and groan and sweat, meanwhile not expecting great things, not counting upon ripe results in our time, not calculating by the rules of our human arithmetic the value of our service or the amount of our compensation, but leaving all that to the master of the estate. And whosoever does this out of a true and honest heart, and with carefulness and fidelity, with him Jesus says that by and by he shall sit down and sup. The good and faithful servant shall partake of God's supper. He shall be satisfied. He shall be filled. Oh, the magnanimity and mercy of God! Not that men can do anything to augment the wealth and splendor of the divine nature or make God happier, for the best are inefficient and unprofitable. But notwithstanding your defects and limitations, O oh, laborer, O oh, sufferer, O oh, martyr, O oh, witness for an essential and despised truth, you shall sup by and by. If only you have been, quote, faithful in a few things, you shall be made ruler over many things, unquote. Gird yourself and wait, for after you have served, you shall sup. After you have suffered, you shall reign. End chapter 3「Chapter Four of Seeing Darkly. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Seeing Darkly by Rev. John Sparhawk Jones. Chapter Four. A New Year Sermon. Quote, and it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark. But it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. Unquote. Zechariah chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. By permission of Cyrus, the Jews of the captivity returned to Judea in large numbers, although many remained in Babylon. The prophets of that era, some five centuries before Christ, were Haggai and Zechariah who supported each other and converged their efforts upon the rebuilding of the temple and the revival of the old forms of worship. Glad that a fragment, at least, of their countrymen had escaped out of the fascinations and entanglements of mighty Babylon, those godly men tried to reconcile them to the plain fare and hard work necessary to the rehabilitation of the Jewish state. The oracles that pass under the name of Zechariah had reference to these contemporaneous events, and also opened long vistas into succeeding ages. These latter being apocalyptic in character, that is, pertaining to the revelation of future and undiscovered events, were naturally unintelligible to those who heard them, probably to the prophet himself, and, indeed, are largely so to us and the modern world who read them now. The text, in which the prophet throws on his canvas a vision of the great day of Jehovah, a dark day of gloom and terror, clearing away at evening into a blue, cloudless sky, is one of his apocalyptic passages. He foresees looming on the far horizon a notable battle, which will outrank in significance the most decisive and famous fields of the world's history. Marathon, Cannae, Tours, Blenheim, Waterloo, Sedan, Gettysburg, none of them will outshine it, by reason of the gravity and reach of the issues involved. So much, at least, may be collected from the prophet's language. Quote, Behold, I will gather all nations unto Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken and the houses spoiled. Then shall Jehovah go forth and fight against those nations, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. In that day the light shall not be clear nor dark, neither day nor night, yet at the evening time there shall be light. Unquote. Such a description foretokens an unparalleled state of things. No contest has yet taken place that deserves to be set forth in such tremendous phrase. There have been battles in which precious interests were at stake, and when the destiny of nations and of creeds and the course of coming history hung upon the uncertain cast of the die. Ideas, institutions, principles, policies have sought from age to age the final arbitrament of arms, but no war has been waged that could properly be described as a gathering of the nations against Jerusalem. 
even should you take the language metaphorically as a pen picture of the conflict between truth and error, righteousness and wrong, even so, that issue has never yet been definitely settled as here predicted by the Hebrew prophet. In every century, moral ideas have had to fight with immoral ones, spiritual forces with carnal, new and high conceptions of progress with old, burdensome traditions and customs, pure doctrines with demoralizing and degraded ones. The kingdoms of light and of darkness have been embattled time out of mind, and have rolled their billows of blood over the earth. But there has been nothing quite commensurate with this oracle, at evening time it shall be light. Probably because the world has not yet reached its evening, it may be in the early afternoon, possibly in the morning, of its history. In any case, it is obvious that finality has not yet been reached. The battle still smokes and thunders. The world, as it stands, is in a mixed state, neither clear nor dark. It is chaotic, bubbling, fermenting, has not worked itself into proportion and balance and a final form. What the ultimate phase shall be that will precede the incoming of a purer and approximately perfect state of society, such as the optimism of the Hebrew prophets and their inspired sagacity foretold, no one can say. They all touch lightly upon this topic, and not in terms to gratify curiosity. They see the future of the world in a large, dim, ragged way, and throw out curt, abrupt, sibylline sentences about it, of somewhat ambiguous meaning. But it is clear that they actually see something shimmering, glowing, globing up in the cloudy vault of coming time. This oracle, that passes under the name of Zechariah, is a sample of their style. The prophet catches a glimpse of restless nations mobilizing and moving against Jerusalem in some then coming age. If any one say, this cannot be literally true, Jerusalem will never again be important enough to attract worldwide attention. It is not according to the geographical fitness of things that it should. The answer is, no man is qualified to affirm this in a world whose fundamental law is change and a perpetual procession of surprising contrasts. Political complications may conceivably set in that can easily shift the seat of interest from Western civilization to the Orient. It would be premature in any one to say what histories are yet to be enacted upon the globe, what continents are to rise out of the undiscovered deep of time, what splendid empires are to shrink and set, and what new and unheard of ones are destined to wheel out of dusk and darkness toward a meridian throne and hold the heavens and rule the earth from shore to shore. Men are sometimes dogmatic and opinionative without warrant of knowledge and experience, so that their confident calculations suffer by comparison with the event. The simple truth is that men do not know and cannot guess what is brewing, what is shaping, what is coming, what road the long caravan of humanity will take, or in what hemisphere and in what lands the great epic actions will yet be done that shall promote the advancing destinies of the race and manifest the increasing purpose of God. All this lies in the shadow, lies silent on the verge of time, is a subject of political conjecture or of apocalyptic dreaming. For practical use, however, the provision of the prophet in the text need not be restricted to any one era or event, howsoever conspicuous and cardinal. In a general way, it announces a truth of universal validity and is a descriptive mark of every age. Indeed, it is denominative of the whole scheme of things under which we live, not alone that generation which, according to Zechariah, shall see the confederated nations girding Jerusalem with armies and trenches and blazing campfires and bristling steel, but all the ages and generations of man on the earth have been neither clear nor dark. The last phase of affairs, the last great day of the reigning regime, will simply be, in this respect, an epitome and culminating expression of all that has gone before. There never has been a time of the world to which this terse and pithy sentence of the Hebrew prophet was not applicable. It is true not only of the historic evolution of the race, but also in the realm of nature. Nature, as it bears upon moral law and the demonstration of moral truth, is neither clear nor dark. The physical universe establishes a few great principles, and proves certain things about God, provided one's mind be ready to admit the doctrine of a personal creator. Power, precision, Adaptation, order, wisdom, method are evinced in the times, velocities, and punctualities of the sidereal heavens. Sentient life also is maintained on the planet by the virtues of sun, air, and rain, so that each species is supplied with proper food. Nature is not totally dark, 
nor, on the other hand, is it perfectly clear. It does not speak decisively concerning the eternity of God, his absolute, uncaused, uncommenced existence, else it would not be possible to assign eternity to matter and force. It is a revelation of God, in some aspects yet only the Old Testament, so to speak, for it does not tell nearly all, nor the best part. The opulent, inexhaustible, infinite God does not arrive at complete self-disclosure in nature. If he did, atheistic materialism could not exist, would have no standing. A person addicted to the narrow and exclusive study of physics may easily issue out of his investigations a religious skeptic, because he sees only obscure footprints of the supreme, a tremendous, anonymous, inexorable energy moving on the whole cosmic order with mechanical precision and in an unconscious way. One does not discover in nature a being who is the sum of all moral perfections. One finds much there that is capricious, incalculable, perplexing. The idea of God as a person, as the Prius of all things, as holy, just, good, cannot be constructed out of natural laws and processes, out of matter, motion, and force. There is the same alternation of light and dark in the revolutions of history and in the corporate life of mankind. Take for an example any divine attribute, and it does not get complete vindication in this twilight world. Justice certainly is not swiftly and universally done. God does not interfere to prevent the slaying of his witnesses. He only takes care that the principles are not slain along with their champions. The martyrs have perished, but their doctrines have survived. Monopolies of power and prosperous vulgarity, combinations of unscrupulous men, often hold a long lease and set their nests among the stars, whence it is hard to dislodge them. One can readily see the dark side if he look at the providential leading of the race. The universal, all-embracing, all-conquering love of God, as the very jewel of his attributes, does not shine conspicuous amid the ignorance, barbarism, squalor, and low, depraved condition of vast populations. Hardly any century but has been filled with alternate hope and despair, hardly any day without a cloud, hardly any invention that has not passed through a probation of suspense and anxiety. This is the way of God with man, to set him down in a mixed scene, changeful, freakish, now blazing up into something like the light of demonstration, now dying down into vast and awful glooms. This same analogy holds good in relation to the Bible. Every religious opinion that can get a living comes hither for some prop or presumption in its favor. Sects and doctrines, the most contradictory, all repair to the Christian revelation as an arsenal of arms and ammunition. No other sacred books are susceptible of such latitude of interpretation, of so much inferential theology. I am not aware that Muhammad's Koran, or the holy books of the Hindus, or the mythology of Hesiod and Homer, which were the Bible of the old classical nations that lived around the Mediterranean, or the precepts of Confucius and the Chinese sages, have been such a bone of contention and apple of discord as the Christian scriptures. The Calvinist finds his definitions of God and man and the divine moral government there. The Romanist finds his hierarchy and sacramental grace. The Quietist finds his inner light and silent waiting and mystic ecstasy and intense subjectivity. The Millenarian finds his views touching the Second Advent and the National Restoration of Israel. The Literalist and the Allegorizer each find support for their methods and conclusions in the Bible. Critics may allege that this proves too much, hence nothing at all, and is an argument against the authenticity of the Christian scriptures. But, if so, it is in keeping with all the other wonders of divine self-disclosure. It is neither clear nor dark. If conflicting theologies did not pitch their tents upon this field, if the Bible were lifted high above all controversy, if its true sense and intention were perfectly luminous and transparent, this would be totally unlike God's treatment of man and mode of action, in nature and in providence. But, so far as we can see, God is self-consistent everywhere, and in all places of his dominion. One points his telescope to the skies, and his microscope to the microcosm on the leaf or in the drop of water, and says, I find skill, order, adaptation here, but not holiness or justice. Thereupon he turns over the leaves of history, and reads how the world has rolled through authentic time, out of darkness into light, out of the Orient into the Occident, out of Asia into Europe, 
out of the stagnation of the East into the energy and adventure of the West. Ah, he says, this is great and wonderful, but not quite satisfactory. I would have made the verdict of history more decisive. I would have made more examples, and given instant emphatic condemnation of the wrong and a triumphant vindication of the right. Next he opens the Bible and finds that the same analogy reigns there. Upon some questions it is day, upon others it is dark. In other words, the disclosure of deity to mankind is an ascending scale, starting with nature, rising into providential action, and culminating in the gospel. And everywhere there is haziness in the air, clear and solar light on some topics, fog and doubt on others. But while this is confessedly true, the prophet's oracle is encouraging in that it affirms that the world is headed in the right direction and moving steadily toward the light. His optimism is not of the deistical sort, which declares that whatever is, is right. It is rather a modification of this, a conviction that whatever is in process of becoming, whatever is continuously on the way to be, the ultimate stage, the finality that will be right, it will be light at evening time. This is a very comfortable doctrine, that whatever appearances may indicate to the contrary, and however dim the outlook for goodness and truth in the earth may be, the broad tendency is in that direction. The world is revolving through slow, secular ages out of darkness into day, out of a crude, sour, astringent state toward an eternity of summer and a golden fruitage. This evidently is the vision of the Hebrew prophet. It is the burden of all true prophecy that the morning must chase the night, that good must overcome evil, and that the Christ must cast out Satan. Moreover, standing today on the edge of a vanishing year, it is spontaneous and becoming in one to reflect upon this blessed and cheering fact that all the dark ages and dispensations that have rolled their firmaments over this world have been unconsciously seeking a clear, placid, splendid sunset, and shall finally ultimate in it as the only solution that can explain them. The sun must set round and red, and broad and full. There must be light at evening, else we shall not be able to expound the mystery of sin and man." This is a great generalization that all the ages of human history and all its civilizations, from the Mongol to the Greek, from the aboriginal man or the paleolithic man, clear up to the summit and highest specimen of the species, and all the ages of stone and iron and lead and bronze, of old primeval giants and barbaric kingdoms, that once rejoiced in their rude, uncouth strength, but went out, star after star, all of them, and have been unconsciously groping their way toward something better, a more stable constitution, a city of God, the kingdom of God and of his Christ. This is really the only consideration that can commend or consecrate them, that each of them was a temporary stage, to be torn down as the vast temple rose nearer to its roof and pinnacle. The bell of judgment rang the curtain down upon them because they were not fit for permanence, were darkness rather than light, held more of evil than of good. And this process must still go forward, the old make way for the new, the lower for the higher, the temporal for the eternal, until at length the great year of jubilee, the age of prediction, the kingdom of the heavens dawns upon the earth, and that which has so long lain potential becomes the actual. This is the organic tendency of things, although, at any one point of time, men may not see it to be so. When John Wycliffe's ashes were scattered upon the Thames, it did not look as if his Bible could live, but it did. When John Huss was burned, it seemed as though his Protestantism had perished also, but it did not. When the splendor of Greece faded out of the sky, the Greek learning still abode in the world, and flamed up later in the revival of letters and in the Greek Testament. Phoenicia passed down the sky, but, in process of time, Spain and England took up the same seafaring tradition, and did infinitely more for the exploration and colonization of the globe. Italy, the birthplace of the modern spirit, declined from her zenith, but not until she had handed over her treasures, her art, scholarship, science, all her humanities to Germany, France, and England. And any contemporary spectator of loud, world-shaking events, who witnessed the winding up of an old and the birth of a new era, a new act in the long historic drama that has been playing on our planet, any such living in a day of stir and strain and horrible confusion and tumult, when perhaps a Scythian barbarism or an army of Goths and Huns or a French revolution broke out, might have said, 
The world is waxing old and in its last phase. Fierce elements of chaos are racking it to pieces. This egg fit will shake it to ashes. Yet it has never been so. The earth with man upon it has continued to wheel around its orbit, and has eventually outrun the gloom and storm, and caught the sunlight once more, and sailed into a milder clime and halcyon seas. God has apparently planted a conservative principle, a reparative virtue, a potential seed of salvation in this world. The old ship, though rocked in a monsoon, has finally righted itself, has never been quite engulfed. From age to age, in every century, it has been light at evening. There have been barbaric invasions, but the barbarians have been at length tamed and civilized. There have been plague and pestilence, but it has put man upon cleanliness, ventilation, sanitation, hygiene. There have been cruel wars for religion, for soul liberty, for conscience and political independence. But the boom of guns has died away. The smoke has cleared out of the sky and over the battle graves have spread green pasture land and acres of waving wheat and corn. The blood of martyrs has been like wine poured forth that has strengthened and solidified the church. Men have trembled for the ark of God. In every period of history some precious interest, some essential principle, some cardinal commandment, some law of duty and safety, has often seemed to be imperiled, almost obliterated. Yet after a time the evil has cured itself, a sharp reaction has set in, and the world has found out that it cannot dispense with decency, order, sobriety, moderation, and justice. Light has come at evening. The same consolation abides for us who look out upon all the sore evils under the sun. If we are permitted to argue from the past, if there is any light in experience, these are not fixtures, not finalities, but are on the way to judgment and a righteous sentence. Bad men and bad measures... All dishonesties and crimes, all organized, powerful, impregnable iniquities, all wastes, abuses, wrongs, are on the road to correction. Or if they will not submit to that, to doom and downfall, at least, if justice is a pillar of God's cloudy, awful throne. Their demise and disgrace may not come in our day, but they are of a perishable nature, and liable to become outdated and outworn, if, indeed, it is a truth that light will come at evening and the children of light will take the kingdom, and the meek inherit the earth. Observe once more that the same law holds true in personal experience. Zechariah's prediction encourages us to commit ourselves trustfully to the unknown future and to the mercy of God, confident that light will finally unweave the darkness amid which we walk. No serious mind but often has such queries as these spring up. Is life a dream? A somnambulism? A mirage? A gay bubble glancing on the tide? Or is it a shadow projected by a tremendous reality behind? Such reflections naturally overtake thoughtful and earnest souls as the years slip by and time assesses our goods and chattels and sells us out. What is life? What is time? What is eternity? Whither do I tend? Surely he must be afflicted with incurable levity who does not, now and again, revolve these solemn topics. The bold philosophy of Bishop Berkeley, called idealism, holds that the whole external world is empty-seeming. The product of mind has no more connection with reality than a word has with the thing to which it is applied. Nothing can be perceived except the ideas of the mind. Matter has no existence save as it is perceived by some intelligence, human or divine. This is radical, thorough-going doctrine, and of a lofty kind. It is the contradictory opposite of materialism and a highly spiritual philosophy. Thinkers in every age have ventured upon ontological speculation. They have inquired, what is being? What is existence? What is this vast, boundless world of eye and ear? What is the ego? What is the non-ego? And they have not been able to reach a unanimous verdict. What is reality? This is one of the secrets to be opened and broken in a higher and a future life, for there will be light at evening. It may well be that now in the flesh we are in contact with shadows, echoes, pretexts, forms, but after a while we shall see, we shall know, we shall touch reality. No doubt this our temporal ignorance is wisely intended, for if there were no temptation there would be no virtue. If there were no darkness you would not know light. If demonstration reigned in all realms there would be no room for hope and faith. 
If righteousness were not persecuted and jailed and iniquity enthroned, a powerful argument for a future state of adjustment would be wanting. If there were no outstanding mysteries, no intellectual perplexity, there would be no progress, no effort, no struggle. At the same time, while this arrangement seems to be necessary for the education of the human soul, under present limitations, it is not installed as a permanent fixture. You have a title to believe that whatever now frets and troubles you, whatever doubt, suspense, and fear ravage your peace, will finally be cleared up, will be explained by some missing link you cannot now find. Light will break. Not only so in some larger, more ample future, but even here it is your right and privilege to move continuously into the light. Each passing year should leave you a more illuminated soul, more cheerful, more hopeful, more contented, more assured. We read that the two-pillar doctrines preached by Wesley and Whitefield in words of flame to the dead, deistical 18th century were the new birth and assurance. They are equally appropriate to our contemporary age. Assurance, conviction, light, joy, these are of first-rate importance to us who go pilgrimizing to eternity. You will want more light as you move on into the great dark, and you can have more. What will you do without light at evening? You must have it, and you can get it from him who cries, quote, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. Unquote. Each fleeting year may increase the inflow of divine life to your dead soul. Each year may bring a more immediate, continuous, and conscious operation of God upon you. Only so can you get light, light as evening draws on. It must enter from beyond, from the outer infinite, from the sphere of spirit. By death to self and by entrance into the sublime spirituality of Christ, into his great renunciation and perfect obedience, there will come an opening of God within you, through which light will gradually spread and shine, and shine more and more. There is no other way to get a religious hope. If anyone complain that life is dark, and the world and death and eternity all dark, frightfully dark, that the fast-filling years bring him no relief, no comfort, no message, no meaning, it must be that he has not come into effectual relation with Jesus Christ, has not learned his secret, has no spark of that perpetual inspiration of God, that illuminated and sustained him, has not come into real sympathy with him who declared, quote, I am the resurrection and the life, unquote. For God hath not appointed us unto darkness and death, but unto light and life. This is man's true destiny. This is the indication of his being. This is written in his constitution. This is the true evolution of his nature, to become a spiritual, illuminated, lofty, and powerful creature, and move forward evermore out of darkness, narrowness, and limitation into the light of a larger life. Each of our mortal years should see this process hastened and visibly maturing, until at length, at the evening time, the light of a better world shall break upon us. End Chapter 4